Hello, this is Dan. Welcome back to Mechanical PE Exam Prep. Today we're going to dive into a pretty juicy controls problem. So let's do it. We have 30 pounds per minute of 180 degree water flowing out of a large mixing tank at a constant rate. The tank receives 210 degrees Fahrenheit saturated steam at a controlled rate of up to 15 pounds an hour. The maximum rate applies to a fully open control valve. The tank also receives 60 degree Fahrenheit water at a constant rate. The incoming water and steam experience ideal mixing and the resultant temperature of the water in the tank is initially 180 degrees Fahrenheit. The tank initially holds 600 pounds of water. Ignore all heat transfer to the surroundings. Assume the valve position changes instantaneously. The temperature of the tank output is monitored by a controller, which controls the entering steam rate. Two types of controllers are available, on off and proportional. Both units have sufficient capacity and duty cycle to handle the full range of steam flows up to 15 pounds a minute. The proportional controller has the following characteristics. Temperature variation between fully open and fully closed signal, 12 degrees. Acceptable temperature set point, 160 to 200 degrees and they want to know four different things. A, if the on-off controller is selected, and if the mass of the water in the tank is constant, how long in seconds must the valve be fully open each minute to keep the tank temperature at 180 degrees? B, if the steam valve jams fully open and there are no changes in the cold water input and mixed water output rates, how long will it take to heat the tank to 190 degrees Fahrenheit? If 180 degrees Fahrenheit water is desired, what's the proportional band for the proportional controller? And D, if 180 degree Fahrenheit water is desired, what should be the set point? Let's talk for a second about the setup and specifically what's happening with A and B, and then we'll outline the steps to go through. So we have this tank, there's cold water coming in and some amount of steam coming in, which can be controlled by this valve. We know the mass in the tank, initially anyway. We know the temperature of the water coming out of the tank. Then there's this sensor that's sensing that output temperature and feeding it into this controller. And the controller is telling the valve to open or close, which controls how much steam comes in. Now, the cold water flow is constant, but the steam flow can vary, which means that if, it's, if there's more steam, that's increasing the energy and temperature in the tank, but it's also increasing the mass in the tank. And if it's less, then the tank temperature comes down. And if it were to drain out, then the mass would also be reduced. So part A is kind of is about steady state. They want to know if the mass of the water in the tank is constant, then you have the same amount of uh, steam and water going in as you have water coming out. And they want to keep the tank temperature constant. B is a little more interesting because they're saying the steam valve jams fully open so you're adding more steam than you need to so that means the temperature is going to rise and the amount of mass in the tank is going to rise and that's not a steady state operation so it actually gets into some uh, differential equations being required to solve part b and um, i actually have a separate video where i go into some of the uh, calculus that's involved in in making that part b work but i'll i'll keep that separate so that this video can be specifically about the controls and the thermodynamics um, aspects of it and then c and d are pretty quick at the end so let's outline all the steps i'm actually going to break it up by parts a b c d and and then we'll walk through the solution so for part a which was the steady state scenario the first thing we're going to do is write the steady state energy balance and what we'll find when we do that is that we have two unknowns. We won't know the mass flow rate of the steam or the cold water at that point. So then we're going to write another equation, which is the mass balance. And now we'll have two equations with two unknowns, which we can solve and find those two mass flow rates. And then once we have those two flow rates, we'll know the mass flow rate of steam, which will allow us to find the amount of time that the valve should be fully open. For part B, we can't write a steady state energy balance because it's not steady state. The mass in the tank is increasing and the, and the amount of energy in the tank is increasing. But what we can do is write an equation for the rate at which energy is being stored. So we'll do that. 
And then what we're going to find is that the enthalpy is a bit of a moving target because enthalpy is a function of temperature and the temperature is changing. So we'll, we'll leave that equation and we'll try to come at it a different way by writing an equation for the total energy in the tank, not, um, not the rate of change, but the total energy as a function of mass and enthalpy. And those things are both functions of time. So we can then differentiate that. And that's how we're going to get toward our differential equation. So the, the next step is to write that equation for the total energy and differentiate. So once we have that, we'll combine the results from 5 and 6 to make our differential equation. And at that point, I'm actually going to suggest you go and watch a separate video that I'm making, which will cover the calculus aspect of that. But in this video, I'll jump right to the general solution of that differential equation so that we can continue with this problem. So in step eight, we'll apply uh, the initial condition that we have to find the particular solution, and then we'll solve for time such that the temperature as a function of time equals 190 degrees. And then for part C, this one's actually pretty straightforward. We're essentially just gonna define what a proportional band is. And for D, we're essentially defining the set point. Okay, so I know that looks like a lot of steps, but I really wanted to break up A and B because it's it was quite a bit of work and I think it's important to, to separate out the pieces so that you can really make sense because A or B, even by themselves, are you know, could be any one piece of these these two parts could be its own question on the test. So going through this whole problem will enable you to answer a variety of different questions. So it's worth taking the time to really break it down and go through it slowly. So let's start with one. We're writing the steady state energy balance for part A. The amount of energy that's going into the tank and the amount of energy that's leaving the tank is the same. So it's at steady state. And the same can be said for the mass. So let's deal with the energy first. We could say quite simply that Q dot in equals Q dot out. Or if we want to be a bit more specific, we could say Q dot steam, I'll just say Q dot S, plus Q dot cold water equals Q dot drain. And each of these heat rates can be expressed as a mass flow rate times an enthalpy. So we can say M dot steam times H. Now what would the enthalpy be for the steam? We know that the steam coming in is saturated and 210 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's going to be Hg for saturated steam at that temperature, T equals 210 degrees Fahrenheit. And we can look that up in the steam table. Plus the mass flow rate for the cold water, which we don't know, times the enthalpy of cold water. Now that's liquid water, so that's going to be H sub F at temperature 60 degrees. And that equals the heat that's going out of the system at the drain. So we'll say m dot d which we do know times that's also liquid water so again hf at temperature 180 degrees okay so hg hf at 60 degrees and hf at 180 degrees can all be looked up in the steam table that's app 23a so hg is 1149.5 btu per pound the 60 degree cold water is 28.08 and the 180 degree water is 148.04. We also know the mass flow rate coming out of the tank is 30 pounds per minute, but we don't know the mass flow rate of the cold water and we don't know the mass flow rate of the steam. We're actually trying to find out how often the valve should be open, how many seconds out of every minute should be open to supply just the right amount of steam both in terms of mass and in terms of heat that that provides to maintain the tank output at 180 degrees. So it's m dot s that we're interested in. So we have an equation here, two unknowns, we're not gonna be able to solve it, but we can also write the mass balance. So we know that the mass in equals the mass out, or to be more specific, the mass in via the steam plus the mass in via the cold water equals the mass flowing out through the drain, and we know that this guy is 30 pounds per minute. 
So we can express, we do a little substitution, we can express, let's substitute for cold water. At this point, I'm gonna skip some of the units just to make the algebra a bit cleaner. We'll say mass flow rate of cold water equals 30 minus mass flow rate of steam. And then I'll substitute that into the first equation. So 1149.5 times mass flow rate of steam plus 28.08 times 30 minus the mass flow rate of steam. That's the substitution there. 30 times 148. So if I distribute this and then I'm gonna subtract over the product of 28 and 30. So on the right side, we end up with 3598.8. And on the left side, we end up with 1121.4 times the mass flow rate of steam. And finally, we can solve for the mass flow rate of steam, which is 3.209 pounds per minute. So now if you recall, this valve has the ability to deliver up to 15 pounds per minute. I just found a typo in here. This is not hours. This is actually supposed to be minutes. But anyway... If the mass flow rate we want is 3.2 instead of 15, unfortunately, the scenario we were given for part A, it's strictly an on-off situation. It's the on-off controller. So we don't have the ability to do proportional control and have the valve be only a fifth open. So the only way we can deal with that is just to open it fully for part of the minute and then close it for the rest of the minute. And that's as good as it's going to get. So what fraction of one minute do we need to have it open? Well, 3.29 divided by what it can do at 100%, which is 15 pounds a minute. That's going to be the proportion we care about. So let's say 3.209 pounds per minute divided by a possible 15 pounds per minute. That gives us a ratio of about 0.214 or 21.4%. So we'll multiply that by 60 seconds and we get a time of 12.8 seconds out of every minute. And that's the answer to part A. So not too bad. We had to solve a system of two equations with two unknowns, but nothing really too crazy there. Part B gets a little interesting. So before we start part B, let's pop back up to the question again and just make sure we have a good handle on what they're asking. If the steam valve jams fully open and if there are no changes in the cold water input and mixed water output rates, how long will it take to heat the tank to 190 degrees Fahrenheit? So they're saying the cold water flow stays the same, but we don't know the cold water flow. We only found the flow rate of the steam. So we have two equations, the two unknowns. We should go back and just for our records, make sure we know what the mass flow rate of cold water is before we move forward. And then the mass flow rate of the outlet is the same and the control valve for the steam is gonna be fully open. So that's gonna be 15 pounds per minute. So now we know all the mass flow rates, but we don't know how long it's gonna take for the temperature in the tank to rise up to 190 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's what we're gonna analyze. So let's jump back down to where we found the, where we did the substitution. We found that the mass flow rate of cold water was 30 minus the mass flow rate of steam. So let's actually do that subtraction. That's going to be 30 minus 3.209. So the mass flow rate of cold water equals 26.79 pounds per minute. And that's going to hold constant. So we'll use that in this next part. Okay, so the key point for this question is now it is not steady state anymore. And what do we mean by that? Q, the amount of heat in the system, is increasing. And M, the amount of mass in the tank, is increasing. So some heat is being stored in the tank. Instead of writing an energy balance, we can say that the rate at which energy is being stored is equal to the difference between the heat that goes in and the heat that comes out. And we can break it down into those two parts. So how do we represent the heat that's going into the system? Well. We have the mass flow rate of steam, which we know, times the enthalpy of the steam, which is the same as what we looked up before. It's Hg at 210 degrees F, plus the energy of the cold water, which is the mass flow rate of cold water, 
times hf at t equals 60, which we also know from before. So everything here is known. We can actually run the numbers and find out exactly how much heat is going to the system. So let's do that. So 15 pounds a minute for the steam flow rate, 1149.5 BTUs per, per pound, plus the mass flow rate of cold water, which we just made it a point to go back and calculate 26.79 pounds per minute times the enthalpy of water, liquid water, at 60 degrees, which we said was 28.08. And if you multiply all that together, we get Q in equals 17,995 BTU per minute. Not bad, so we have Q in, or Q dot in, I should say. It's a rate of energy change per unit time. All right, so now let's take a look at Q out. Q out is entirely through the drain. So it's the mass flow rate of the drain, which we know, times the enthalpy of the water that's leaving the tank. So this we know, but now this is where it gets interesting, this H out. This is a bit of a moving target because the temperature in the tank is increasing as the amount of heat in the tank is increasing and the enthalpy is a function of the temperature. So enthalpy is a function of temperature and we don't know the temperature. In fact, the temperature is changing, so the temperature is a function of time, lowercase t. Now we can sort of expand on the idea that enthalpy is a function of temperature because if you take a look at the steam table and you look at the enthalpies for liquid water at different temperatures, you might notice it's always offset by exactly the same amount. You could say H equals Cp delta T. Cp for liquid water is one. It's really just the change in temperature and it's always referenced off the freezing point of water so the total amount of, we're not interested in temperature change, we're interested in the total amount of enthalpy in that water. So we can just subtract 32. And you can see this if you look in the table, that this always holds true. In general, HF equals temperature minus 32, and then has units of BTU per pound. So that's kind of an approximation that we can use for H out. We can say it's temperature minus 32, but we have to appreciate the fact that temperature is a function of time. At t equals zero, initially, we know the tank temperature is 180 degrees, but as this control valve is stuck fully open, that temperature is gonna rise and eventually it's gonna get to 190 degrees. The furthest we're gonna be able to take it is to say Q dot out is the mass flow rate, so we can plug that in, 30 times H out, which is T as a function of time, minus 32. And if you want to distribute the 30, you can do that and say Q out is 30 times T as a function of time minus 960. So then coming back to our original equation, we were interested in Q stored, how, how fast or what's the rate at which energy is being stored in the system. That's going to be the difference between Q in and Q out. And that's going to be the 17,995 minus this 30 times temperature as a function of time, minus 960. And then we can simplify that just to subtract, or rather add the 960, because you have to distribute the negative. This ends up being 18,955 minus 30 times temperature as a function of time. And now I'm gonna write this a little differently in the next, right here. This is a change in the rate of energy transfer per unit time, and since this, you could probably tell this is going in a, in a calculus direction at this point, I'm gonna express this as dQ dt, where capital Q is the total amount of energy, so the rate of change of energy per unit time is, um, is dQ dt. Our goal is to find the amount of time at which the tank temperature is 190 degrees, but all we have at this point is an expression for the rate of change in energy per unit time, which is a function of temperature, which is a function of time. What, what we really want to get to is a differential equation that relates temperature as a function of time and its rate of change. And if we can find a solution to that differential equation, that will allow us to relate temperature and time. Right now, we're, we're stuck because we don't, we have essentially an equation with two unknowns, one of which is a function. So in the next step, we're gonna zoom out a bit 
and try to come up with a more general re- way to represent dq dt that addresses the total mass and the enthalpy. So I'll say total energy accounting for mass. So what if we say q, total energy, as a function of time is equal to the total amount of mass in the tank, which is also a function of time, times the enthalpy of the water in the tank, which is a function of time. Well, we just talked about the enthalpy and how we might be able to express that as a function of time. That part, we can just use this. So we'll say h of t roughly equals t as a function of time minus 32. Now the mass, we can write an expression for the mass as a function of time. We know the initial mass was 600 and we know all the mass flow rates going in and out. We can add those together. We have the mass flow rate of steam going in is 15 pounds per minute. The mass flow rate of cold water going in is 26.79 pounds per minute. And the mass flow rate of the drain, which is coming out, so I'll make it a negative, is 30 pounds per minute. And we can multiply that times time. So if you simplify that, you get mass as a function of time equals 600 plus 11.79 times t for time. So now we have mass as a function of time and enthalpy as a function of temperature, which is a function of time. So the total amount of energy in the system is the product of those two. So let's multiply them together. We'll say t of t minus 32 times 600 plus 11.79 t. And now we have to foil this product of two binomials. So that's 600 t of t plus 11.79 t times big T of t minus 377.3 t minus 19,200. Now, what we can do is we can take the derivative of this expression, because this expression is for the total heat as a function of time. But we can take its derivative and find the rate of change of heat with respect to time. And we'll have a different representation for dq dt than we previously found. And then we can set the two equal. And by relating them, we'll end up with a function, not a function, but an expression that only contains temperature and time. And that's the differential equation we're after. So let's go ahead and take the derivative of q with respect to t. So t, big T is a function of little t. So this is going to be 600 times t prime of little t. And then here we have to use the product rule because we have 11.79t is, is 1. And this acts as a, a separate function. So that works out to 11.79t times t prime of t plus by product rule 11.79 which is just the derivative of this part only times t of t not differentiated and then this part the derivative is just minus 377.3 and then the derivative of a constant is always zero so that is our expression for dq of t and now as i mentioned before we're going to set this equal to the previous form which was up here, 18,955 minus 30 t of t. So I'll write that all out. Okay, so now for the first time, we have an expression that relates temperature as a function of time, time, and the derivative of temperature as a function of time. So what this is gonna lead to is a differential equation that relates temperature and time. The next step, algebraically is to try to group this in a way where we have a term for t prime of t, a term for t of t, and a term for everything else. So let's start with the term for t prime of t. t prime of t is going to be 11.79 t, that's coming out of this term, plus 600 coming out of this term. And those are on the same side, so I'm actually writing the right side of the equation right now. And that's all the things multiplied times t prime plus t as a function of t multiplied by that's multiplied by two things 30 t on the left and 11.79 t on the right so i'm going to add that negative 30 over since i'm writing the right side of the equation so it's 41 
and then the other side of the equation there's nothing except this constant and I'll add over the 377 that gives us 19,332 and lo and behold we have a first order linear differential equation I had to crack open my own my old calculus books to figure out how to solve this thing but to keep this video from getting too long I'm gonna cut right to the chase this equation has a general solution of the following form t as a function of t equals 19,332 over 41.8 plus some arbitrary constant over 11.8 t plus 600 raised to the 3.54. Now if you're interested in how that comes to be, please watch the separate video where I go through how to break down this differential equation and um, use a integration factor to figure out uh, what the solution is. So this gives us temperature as a function of time in general, but we have this arbitrary constant k which we don't know so the way we have to find k is by using an initial condition and we have an initial condition we know that at time zero the temperature is 180 degrees fahrenheit right when we first start off we know that the temperature in the tank so we could write this as t of zero equals 180. so let's plug that in to the equation t of zero, I'm dividing on this term here as a constant that's going to be 462.5 plus k over, this term is going to be 11.8 times zero, so that's zero, I won't even write that, that leaves 600, and 600 is being raised to the 3.54, and that has to equal 180, so 462.5 plus k over Let's figure out what that denominator is. It's actually going to be really big. 600 raised to 3.5 turns out to be 6.8 times 10 to the 9th. Now we can subtract 462 from both sides and we get negative 282.5. And now we just have to multiply by that giant number on both sides and we will have k. k is negative 1.93 times 10 to the 12th. And that's what we need to plug into the general solution to get our particular solution. So our particular solution, t as a function of t, is 462.5 minus k, 1.93 times 10 to the 12th, over 11.8t plus 600, all raised to the 3.54. And we want to know what value of t, little t for time, makes the temperature equal 190 degrees. So now all we have to do is solve this equation for little t. You could do this, you could do this directly algebraically or you can do it by trial and error. I thought I was gonna have to do trial and error so I built a spreadsheet to do it for me and then I realized now this is actually not an issue to do it algebraically. So let's just crank through it. You can add over this whole term, subtract the 190, we end up with 272.5 equals 1.93 times 10 to the 12th over 11.8 t plus 600 raised to the 3.54. If you want to get this whole denominator by itself, you can multiply over there and then divide by the 272, 7.08 times 10 to the 9th. And now we have to raise both sides to 1 over 3.54. Only then can we get this by itself. So now I'm raising 7.08 times 10 to the 9th to 1 over 3.54, and I get 606.1. Then of course we can subtract 600, so we get 11.08t equals 6.1, and now we can divide by 11.8, and we get t equals 0.516, and t has, a unit, has units of minutes, so if you multiply that by 60 seconds, that is 31 seconds. And that is answer B. So that's it, that's all it takes for, that's all the time required when that valve is fully open for the tank temperature to increase to 190 degrees. So it, it happens pretty fast. And I think it makes sense because the enthalpy of saturated steam is so high compared to the enthalpy of water that that temperature can really run up. And also we know to keep the temperature flat, steady state, based on all the flow rates we had in part A, 
that it only required basically 20% of the valve to, to maintain that. So if it's open 100%, that's five times as much, it's really gonna change the temperature very rapidly. And that's why it only takes half a minute. Um, now it's definitely a bit of a leap that we got to that differential equation and then you know, I just gave you the solution. I don't think you'll have to solve a differential equation on, uh, on the PE, but I, I enjoyed going through this problem and I thought it was uh, good to see and really understand some of the math behind what makes a physical situation like this play out the way it does. So I would encourage you to go and check out the other video uh, and, and just, you know, at least walk to remind yourself how differential equations get solved. Um, but if not, we'll just close out this example with parts C and D. So for part C, they wanna know the proportional band. And this is really just a definitional thing. So if I had to define proportional band in my own words, I would say it's the size of the range of temperatures through which the valve strokes. So in this case, we were told that the temperature variation between fully open and fully closed signal was 12 degrees. That means that this controller is reading this temperature there's some 12 degree range through which it's gonna go from fully open to fully closed. So that's the proportional band, it's 12 degrees. So after all that hard problem and differential equations and everything, they uh, threw uh, an easy one in there. And then the next part, they wanna know the set point. And definitely don't overthink this one. The set point is exactly what you would think it would be. It's 180 degrees. So you want 180 degree water coming out of the bottom. So that's what you want to set the controller for in order to produce 180 degree water. And that's answer D. Now let's just rationalize that answer a little bit. The goal of this setup is to produce 180 degree water. So you're measuring the temperature at the output of the tank and then feeding that back to this controller, which is controlling the valve. If you had to figure out exactly what the valve should be doing at what temperatures. You can actually sketch this out. You could say, if you want to relate the temperature to the valve position as a percentage, when the temperature is 180 degrees, that means that the system is satisfied, so the valve should be completely closed. It doesn't need to do any more heating once the water is at the desired temperature. So we'll say this is 180 degrees and the valve is at 0%. Now, if the temperature is slightly above 180 degrees, then you definitely don't want the valve open because you don't want to do any more heating. So this just stays right at zero. And if the temperature is less than 180 degrees, you don't necessarily want the valve to be wide open because you don't want to overshoot and make water that's too hot. So you only want it to be slightly open. And if it's a, if it's a little colder, you want it to be a little bit more open and more open and more open. And the further it is from 180, the more open you want it to be. So this is actually linear, assuming that the valve is, I mean, the valve obviously isn't linear, but you know, to if you can control it down to the percentage exactly, it might look something like this, where by the time it gets to the other end of the proportional band, that's when it's gonna be 100% open. So here's where it's 100%. And we know the proportional band is 12 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, this point, the lower end of the proportional band would be 168 degrees. And they, they didn't ask us this, but, you know, just so you have an understanding of how that valve should operate. 180 degrees, fully closed. 168 degrees, it's fully open. Anywhere in between, it's, it's proportional controller. So if the temperature happens to be 174 degrees, which is halfway between, then it would be 50% open at that point. And anywhere colder than 168, it's gonna be 100% open. So hopefully that makes sense. It's, uh, it's a long problem and had some complexity to it, but hopefully it uh, helped you think through this setup and wasn't completely intimidating going through the differential equations. Any questions or comments, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.